This video is supported by Skillshare. August 24th, 2006. A date that will live in infamy. Okay, one of the dates that will live in infamy. Because that was the day that the International Astronomers Union declared that Pluto, our favorite little buddy in the sky, was no longer a planet. Aww. And people's heads went this has caused confusion and controversy that has continued to this very day, 14 years later. You're doing it in the comments right now, aren't you? But it's not just the emotional attachment we feel to our solar system's little oddball, it also kind of upturned everything that we were taught about solar systems. When we were kids, we were taught that the solar system was made up of basically four things. Planets, moons, asteroids, and comets. And a star in the middle, of course. But as it turns out, just because we like to put things into nice little boxes does not mean that the universe will comply. The universe is indifferent to your OCD. We looked around and we found planets without atmospheres, moons with atmospheres, asteroids the size of moons, moons the size of planets, and we began to realize that our solar system was way more complicated than just four things. And Pluto was a weird middle ground anyway, you know, and then we started finding things like Ceres and Eris that were, you know, too big to be asteroids, but too small to be planets, and then just suddenly just our categories just didn't really make any sense anymore. So it made sense to come up with a new category. Dwarf planets. So Pluto went from being the run of the litter to the king of the dwarves. But the lesson of Pluto is, again, sometimes our need to organize things doesn't exactly fit with what the universe has in mind. The universe, it turns out, is far weirder than our taxonomy. When does a planet stop and a star begin? The simple answer is that when a planet gets massive enough and it compresses and compresses harder and harder, eventually atoms in the core begin to fuse. And then, much like Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga, a star is born. Like take Jupiter, we often called it something of a failed star. You know, it wasn't quite strong enough to make hydrogen fuse into helium in the core, but it is strong enough to make hydrogen turn into weird, like, metallic hydrogen. Wanna be a star? Go hit the gym, Jupiter! Dost thou even hoist Jupiter? But what if Jupiter was bigger? Say, 12 to 20 times bigger? It might not be strong enough to light up in the center, but it might be big enough to smolder. It wouldn't quite be a star, but it wouldn't be a planet either. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a brown dwarf. And a brown dwarf is its own thing! <laughs> so, I know David S. Pumpkins is like five years old and it's not Halloween or anything, but I mean, it, it, it's still funny, right? Yeah, I don't know. What, you think I should take it out? Yeah, I don't think it works. Yeah, I'm leaving it in. F*** you, I nailed it. Brown dwarfs were discovered on January 6, 1994 by Rafael Robolo, Maria Osorio, and Eduardo Martin using the 80cm telescope at the TIDA Observatory. Thus, the first brown dwarf was named TD1, and it was found in the Pleiades open cluster. Ever since then, the universe has just gotten weirder and weirder. Like, where do we actually place this non-planet, non-star? And how did they find it in the first place? Turns out lithium was the smoking gun. As I mentioned before, stars fuse hydrogen into helium by smashing two protons together, but they can also smash three protons together and get lithium. And this lithium is usually burnt off in normal stars, but in cooler brown dwarf stars, there's still a preponderance of lithium in the atmosphere. So when astronomers ran spectral data on some of these cool stars out there, they found that there was a lithium signature there, which indicated that there is fusion going on in the core, even though it's not shiny. So again, it's sort of a star, but not a star. Now to really get an idea of just how dim a brown dwarf star is, just take a quick look at your hersbrunck brussel diagram that I'm sure you have laying around in front of you. What, no? Fine, here. Below the M-class stars are now these little dim flickering stars that we call brown dwarfs. Think of them as the stars that just couldn't quite enter astral puberty. Now this is possible for a few different reasons. One is possibly just that they don't have the mass to convert that hydrogen into helium, meaning they aren't any bigger than 0.08 M, M being solar masses. Or the cloud that these brown dwarfs formed from just didn't quite have the ingredients necessary to make a star. Or it could possibly be something called quantum electron degeneracy pressure. QEDP basically creates an outward pressure at the core that prevents the ingredients from falling into the core and fusing. But yeah, for any or all of those reasons, a brown dwarf star kind of remains in that limbo between a failed star and a supermassive hot gaseous planet. Like your mom. Are you feeling bad for brown dwarfs yet? Aww. 
because you should probably feel bad for brown dwarfs. So we created this new category of objects called brown dwarfs, but of course, as soon as we do that, there's an object that decides it's not gonna fit into that nice little box. It does not fit and it does not sit. This is a super chonk brown dwarf that is adorably named SDSS J0103 plus 1535. It's 750 light years away, 10 billion years old, and it's 99.99% helium and hydrogen, making it the purest brown dwarf in the universe to date, actually 250 times more pure than our own sun. And it's 90 times more massive than Jupiter, meaning it's plenty big enough to actually become a star. And yet, it did not become a star. Scientists are still unsure exactly how this happened. Why don't you starify, SD? Why are you playing small? And the more of these brown dwarfs that we found, the more different magnitudes and types that we've been able to encounter. Everything from a totally black brown dwarf that's out there, can't be seen hardly even with telescopes, to brown dwarfs that can be seen with the naked eye. And you would think that we would have learned our lesson from Pluto and from the brown dwarfs and stopped trying to organize everything into categories, but no. We've created various categories of brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are classified as L, T, and Y dwarfs. Class L dwarfs are cooler than Class M stars at 1300 to 2000 Kelvin. They're reddish brown in color. They don't have titanium oxide or vanadium oxide bands, but instead has metal hydride emission bands and atomic lines of alkali metals. And only 900 have been discovered so far. Class T dwarfs are between 700 and 1300 Kelvin. They're dark magenta to the naked eye and they have an abundance of methane. Out of all the brown dwarfs, these are the most popular and most abundant brown dwarfs. The first one identified was Gliese 229b, and they're very light in mass. Gliese, for example, is only 3% the mass of our sun. Class Y dwarfs are around 370 Kelvin, which is pretty darn chilly for a wannabe star. They're about 5 to 15 times the mass of Jupiter, and pretty much just big, cold, dark, borderline planets. Some rare Class Y dwarfs emit no light whatsoever and appear almost entirely black. And many of these dwarves have incredible storms that take place on them, sometimes raining molten iron. And because they're so cool, the likelihood of any life forming around them is pretty much impossible. Now, brown dwarves are interesting not just because they defy classification, but because they might, possibly, according to one theory, be a solution for dark matter. As you know, our observations of the way things move around in the universe don't quite add up with the amount of mass that we see out there in the universe, which means there's something out there creating a lot of mass that we just can't quite see. What's something else that we can't see very well? Brown dwarfs. And the number of brown dwarfs could be in the billions, potentially. Some people speculate that there's a ratio between regular stars and brown dwarfs of around like one to six. And considering there's around 250 billion stars in our own galaxy, one sixth of that, is around 41.6 billion brown dwarfs potentially out there. So yeah, that's the thought. All these extra brown dwarfs that are out there that maybe we can't even see might be the thing that's causing all this dark matter weirdness to pop up. UCLA astronomy professor Ian McLean said that maybe this is the case. He said it could make up a small but significant contribution to dark matter. Brown dwarfs won't account for all the so-called dark matter though. He does make the point that brown dwarfs are kind of proof that the missing matter that we're looking for could be out there. The fact is we just can't quite see it. This does take a little bit of the woo-woo out of the whole dark matter thing, but it does make you kind of wonder, we just discovered brown dwarfs, what other dark but massive objects might be out there in the universe that could account for all this? You know, micro black holes, burnout out star systems, galaxies whose stars have all snuffed out, you know, who knows? Brown dwarves have also been theorized as uh, an answer to one of the big questions in our own solar system. There's been a lot of speculation over the years that there might be a ninth planet out there uh, orbiting in a big orbital circle around the, uh, the solar system. They call it Planet X. And this happens because there's several comets that have been flung out from the Oort cloud in a similar direction, meaning that at some point way back in our past, some massive object must have swung past or gone into orbit around our star. We've often called this Planet X, but maybe it's a brown dwarf. Maybe there's a brown dwarf right out there in our backyard that we just can't quite see, you know, because of its brown dwarfness. Our understanding of the universe is expanding as fast as the universe itself. It was only 25 years ago that we first discovered brown dwarfs. Now we think there might be 41 billion of them in our galaxy. Possibly ones circling our own star. But one thing is for sure, the universe will never be done giving us more surprises. Look, so maybe you're watching this video and you feel a bit of a kinship with brown dwarves. You kind of understand and identify with brown dwarves because your own life is in a bit of a limbo between the thing that you want to be doing and the stuff that you have to do. I know that feel, son. Well, look, it's a new year, still relatively new anyway, and it's a great time to get started doing exactly that. And one good place to get started is the class 
Discover Success, Seven Exercises to Discover Your Purpose, Passion, and Path on Skillshare. This class is hosted by Emma Gannon, an author, speaker, and host of the Control-Alt-Delete podcast. In this class, she breaks down how she went from working at her day job for a magazine to finding success on her own terms and how you can do it too. In this class, she'll help you to cut through the BS to find out what really moves you and brings you joy and how you can start with little steps to make that passion the thing that pays the bills using time-tested techniques and action plans that'll give you the confidence to go after what you want. Look, I'm a huge proponent of finding your own way and doing your own thing, getting out of the rat race. I've luckily been able to do it myself with this channel and one of the ways that I got started doing that was listening to people like Emma. You know, you don't, you don't have to figure it out on your own. You can learn from the experiences of other people. And this is, of course, just one of hundreds of classes on Skillshare covering everything from entrepreneurship, design, videography, cooking, you name it. If you've got a passion for it, you can find it on Skillshare. Viewers of this channel get two months free when you click on the link in the description below and you're off to the races, exploring your creativity like never before. And after that, it's only $10 a month, so it's, it's a great deal and it's a great way to get started doing what you love to do. So check it out if you haven't before, Skillshare, link is in the description down below. Big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Patreons, the answer files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, growing a community, helping me to have a team around it. It's just, they're, they're all awesome people. Uh, there's some new guys that have joined real quick. Let me murder their names. Their names are Nick Banco, uh, The Son I Abandoned, Ah, The Machine That Goes Ping, some interesting names this week, Arif Sheck, Dave Town, Daniel Ziegler, Jason Williams, Aquavite, Matt Cooper, who I just met the other day, uh, Louis Gentle, or Gentile, uh, Nate Patterson, Mayoria, Philip Stouffer, Spencer Redfern, Andre Forcier, Michael Houston, Kyle Smith, Jeff Novak, and Ed Fisher. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to early access to videos and access to me and the whole community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the other links down here on the side that have my face on it. And if you like those videos, only if you like them, I invite you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. Also, t-shirts are available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. It's not just t-shirts, it's stickers, it's hoodies, it's caps, I believe, mugs, just about anything with these cool designs on it. Um, they're designed by a guy in Prague who does some amazing stuff, so go check it out. You might find something you like, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Go! And I'll leave it at that. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.